Hey everybody, today we're out here with the fire-breathing 475 horsepower Dodge Durango. If you're looking for a crossover that is quote unquote affordable in America that has three rows and goes zero to 60 in under five seconds, this is one of the incredibly few options in America. If you wanna go faster than this and still have three rows, you're gonna be looking at something like a Tesla Model X or of course a luxury three row crossover. This is the Dodge Durango that I did not buy. I ended up getting the slightly slower model, the one with the smaller V8 engine under the hood. But one of the other reasons that you'd wanna take a look at something like this is the same reason that I ended up buying my Dodge Durango, the towing ability. With 8,700 pounds of towing ability, this Durango beats out most body on frame SUVs in America. Something like the Ford Expedition will tow more, 9,300 pounds. So just a hair more than the model we're talking about right here but this beats the GMC Yukon, the Chevy Suburban, something like the Toyota Sequoia, or even mid-sized pickup trucks like the Chevy Colorado, GMC Canyon, and Toyota Tacoma by a wide margin when it comes to towing ability. And it also does better than most of them when it comes to the way the vehicle tows out on the road as well. An interesting bit of trivia is that the weight and size of the tow vehicle really matter when it comes to overall towing ability because a heavy trailer is not going to push the tow vehicle around quite as much. And this SRT Durango right here, even as fast as it is, manages to weigh more than most Ram 1500s out there. For SRT duty, the Durango's front end changes a little bit. We get the sort of frowny face grille here that reminds me an awful lot of the Ram Rebel. And then we get a lot of extra cooling going on up front because we do have that bigger engine under the hood. We get functional hood vents, these exhaust air, this one lets air in right there to help cool the top of the engine. And then we get some enlarged cooling areas right there on the front bumper. Personally, one of the reasons that I didn't get the SRT Durango is the front end look. I don't think it's quite as elegant as the rest of the Durango lineup. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. Which do you like better? Because of the overall age of the Durango, we don't find LED headlamps up front. These are just HIDs, although we do have LED fog lamps at the bottom. If we want to be technical about it, the Durango, including the SRT, is a three-row crossover in America. I realize that some folks bristle at calling the Durango a crossover, but in reality, this is one of the only true crossovers available in America because this blends truck features and car-like features into one vehicle. And crossovers out there like the Toyota Highlander or the Honda Pilot, they're really large minivans. There's not a lot of truck going on in that design other than their lifted ride height and maybe boxy proportions. But the Durango is quite different. We have a rear wheel drive setup with the same eight speed automatic transmission and the same V8 engines under the hood that we find available in the Ram pickup line. We find a variant of this 6.4 liter engine under Ram's three quarter ton and one ton trucks. The 5.7 liter V8 that's also available is the same one that we find in the Ram 1500, with obviously some slight power output differences between this and the truck line. Under the hood, we find the same 6.4 liter V8 engine that we find in the Grand Cherokee SRT. That's quite logical because the Durango is very closely related to the Grand Cherokee. This is, in essence, just a stretched Grand Cherokee with a slightly different engine lineup and slightly lower suspension overall. This engine produces 475 horsepower and 475 pound-feet of torque. That's a pretty big bump over the 5.7 liter V8. It's the combination of everything that gives the Durango that fast zero to 60 acceleration. The way the engine is programmed, the way the transmission is programmed, the extra horsepower under the hood, and that final drive ratio in the back as well. Rather unusually for a performance model, towing ability actually goes up when you get the SRT versus the 5.7 liter V8. The 5.7 liter V8 Durango can tow up to 7,400 pounds when properly equipped. That is already significantly more than any other three row crossover out there. That takes it on up to 8,700 pounds. Now, why am I standing next to these large water tanks here? Well, at home, I'm involved in a large scale water project for our neighborhood and we are adding 30,000 gallons of extra water storage that I'm splitting with our next door neighbor. And to get these tanks home, I used my heavy equipment trailer right here, which weighs about 3,800 pounds in its own own right and I was able to drive two of these tanks down the road absolutely no problem with the SRT. The SRT has much larger brakes than the regular Durango. According to my calculations we get 28% more swept area on the brakes up front so that helps you stop those heavier loads a little bit better and as I said the ratios are different so that results in an effective drive ratio of 17.4 to 1 instead of 14.5 to 1 in the 5.7 liter V8 and that's part of how we can tow these larger and heavier loads. Now although these tanks themselves are not that heavy 
heavy, you can see that they're very, very large. So if you're towing this down the road at 55 or 60 miles an hour, there's an awful lot of wind resistance. And that's really where the bigger engine comes in because this was able to do that, hang out in seventh or sometimes even eighth gear going down the road at 60 miles an hour or so. Now, obviously fuel economy was pretty atrocious. This particular one is rated for 15 MPG combined. When towing these larger loads out there, the overall weight of the two tanks and the trailer was right around 6,500 pounds or so. Our fuel economy was right around nine miles per gallon. My opinion on the Durango's front seat comfort has changed over time for the better. When I first bought my Durango, I wasn't necessarily the biggest fan of the seats. As I've said before, the Durango seats have sort of a, a stiffer bottom cushion than I'm used to. It feels like you're sitting on the seat rather than in the seat. But on the flip side, we have a decent range of motion and we have the available four-way adjustable lumbar support, a nice touch that not all of the competitors offer. We also have a powered tilt telescopic steering column that's memory linked to the two position memory over there on the door. When it comes to my front seat comfort score, I'm gonna give these seats nine out of 10 points. I recently spent eight hours in this vehicle towing water tanks halfway across California and then 12 hours on a longer road trip in my own Durango, and I have to say that those longer trips really have changed my opinion of the seats. The Durango is available in three different seat combinations. The absolute base model of the Durango is a two row crossover with a really big cargo area back there, but the rest of the Durango lineup will have three rows of seats. If you get the top end Citadel trim like I have, or this SRT, then it's a six seat vehicle only. We get two seats right here in the center, two in the back, and then of course the two up front. The rest of the Durango lineup will be a seven passenger vehicle with a bench seat right here in the second row. But any way you slice it, the Durango has less interior room inside than some of those newer crossovers like the Telluride or the Palisade. That's just one of the trade-offs for getting the big V8 engines under the hood. Even though the Durango is one of the longer three row crossovers in this particular segment, interior legroom is notably behind something like that new Hyundai Palisade. Back here in the second row, we have a fixed center console in this particular model with a padded armrest, a pretty deep storage bin right under there. And it's a two tiered affair, so you can put a lot of stuff there. We have two cup holders, but it's not removable. So if you wanted to get back there into the third row, your only option is to flip and fold these seats. It's a two hand operation. Click that right there and then we pull this red flap up and that tilts in that manner. The second row seats do not slide forward and backwards, so you cannot apportion space a little bit more equitably. What you've got in the third row, that's all you're gonna get. The third row in the Durango is not as wide as some of the three passenger third rows that we see in the crossover segment, mainly because these wheel wells in the back were designed to accommodate some very, very wide tires, and they do intrude on the interior just a little bit. In an interesting touch, SRT models get these burgundy seat belts even back here in the third row. When it comes to overall legroom and headroom, the third row is pretty accommodating in the Durango overall. Now my head does touch the ceiling way back here before the headrest. So I would have to crane my head to one side in order to actually sit with my head back on the headrest. But I do find this a relatively comfortable seating position just as I am right here with my head not touching anything at all. I have about an inch or so of headroom in this sort of little headroom dish that we see right here in the roof line. If I lean further back, then it would be hitting right back here around the opening for the rear hatch. Because the second row seats don't slide forward and backward, I get about maybe about half inch of leg room or so right here behind the seat as long as it's not reclined. But the second row person couldn't really squish my legs back here other than just reclining the seat a little bit because they don't move further rearward. Because the second row seats don't slide forward and backward, there is no ability to try and share the leg room in this vehicle overall. So it's not like the front seat person could move a little further forward, second row person could move a little further forward to make the third row person more comfortable. But as it is, overall legroom is pretty decent. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that I do own a Durango, so some of my opinions may be a little bit stronger than we see in some of the other vehicles. And also keep in mind that we are in the very top end SRT trim, so there are going to be things that you'll see in here that we don't find in the lesser versions. We have height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger up front and four-way adjustable headrests. We find those in most Durango models. Because this vehicle has the rear seat entertainment system, we find inputs on the side of the front seat backs. And to help you remember that you bought the SRT trim, we have that SRT logo on the front seats. These are a combination of leather and suede inserts. This is an imitation suede product. These seats are perforated and they are ventilated as well as heated. But in this material, it's a little bit difficult to see the perforations. If I zoom in a little bit, you can see those right there in the middle of that seat back. The entire seat back is not perforated. It's just that center section right there, sort of by your lumbar. 
you can see that we have moderately aggressive side bolsters. They're not a great deal more aggressive than we find in the regular model, and they're not adjustable. Moving over to the front doors, we find soft touch materials at the top of the dashboard and a soft leather armrest right there in the middle, but there's still a decent amount of hard plastic down there towards the bottom of the door. One thing that FCA has done a great job on lately is really improving the quality of their interiors, but because the Durango is one of the older products, we still see some hints of old Chrysler, old FCA in here. So we see a lot of hard plastic, as I said, right down there at the bottom of the door. And I have to say that it does come across as a little bit clashy with a stitch leather dashboard that we find right over here. So we get full stitch leather on the dashboard, that leather portion of the armrest, but then kind of a mix of materials for the front door itself. Moving back to the dashboard, again, this is a full leather stitch dashboard all the way up there to the defogger vents, and then all the way down to just below that trim strip right there on the passenger side. That wraps down on either side of this infotainment and climate control cluster. Unlike the very top end trims of the Grand Cherokee, there's no option to complete the leather treatment and have it go all the way to the floor. I have to say that is one thing that really dresses up the very top end Trackhawk version of the Grand Cherokee. Now, admittedly, that is more expensive than the Durango we're looking at, but I do think it would have been a nice touch in this interior. In the center of the dashboard, we have this 8-inch color touchscreen infotainment system. It supports Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. And because we're in the SRT model, we get a few screens that we don't see in the regular Durangos. The sport modes are customizable, so for instance, if we hit over to custom and then we can click the custom setup button, we can choose how we want the transmission to behave. Street, for instance, turn the paddles on, off. Stability control, three different modes. All wheel drive, whether we want a 50-50 power split or a definite rear wheel drive power split. This does have an active center differential. We can choose how the adaptive suspension will behave and how stiff the steering is. We can also click over to race options to see what the launch control is set to. So we can change the engine RPM for launch control, how the shift lights behave, whether you want them on, off, shift light RPM for the various gears there. That's kind of an interesting touch because you can have different shift speeds for different gears if that's what you want to do. Continuing down the dashboard, we have some physical controls for the dual zone automatic climate control, a button to get us over to that SRT page, single button press to engage launch control. This is really, really easy in SRT vehicles button for the lane keeping assistance system and a button to disable the parking sensors front and rear at the same time. Below that we find the two USB inputs and a 12 volt power cord. I have to say that I dislike the fact that the USB ports are displayed right there rather than having them hidden away either behind a little door right there or in the center armrest. I think for a vehicle that's this expensive I would have liked to have seen the USB ports hidden away. We have the same sort of T-style shifter that we find in other Durango models. Drive us all the way back, manual mode over to the left pull towards the driver for gear up. We then have two cup holders here. They're not the same size though. One is slightly bigger than the other. Between the front seats, we have a padded armrest. If we open this up, in this model, we find the optional CD player. If you've ever wondered what it looks like in an FCA vehicle, they stick this single slot CD player somewhere in the vehicle. In the Durango, it happens to be right here in the center console. Having the CD changer there means we don't really have a lot of storage space left. And as you can see, I can't really fit my large smartphone in there with that power cord still connected. There is a 12 volt power outlet in there, but you'd be hard pressed to really use this area for too much. There is a little cord slot there, so if you wanted to put your smartphone in there somehow and then strap its cord across, you might be able to keep it in there. The instrument cluster is a tweaked version of the Parsha LCD cluster that we see in other Durango models. But instead of having a physical tachometer over here on the left, they give us a physical speedometer on the left and they move the tachometer to the LCD right in the middle. The theme of the LCD has changed a little bit, and we now have some physical elements right there on the LCD screen. So we have a physical dial right here around this ring. That means that we don't have quite the same array of different views in this LCD as we see in some of the rest of the lineup. Right now you're taking a look at the little display for the launch control, so you see it tells us what we have to do in order to activate it. We have to be at zero, we have to be on level ground, the steering has to be straight ahead, so if I turn the steering wheel, you'll see that the steering wheel would start uh, blinking there. It has to be in first gear and your foot has to be on the brake pedal. Those are the basics, but other than that, it's just a one button launch operation. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn that off now so you can see the rest of the screen. Unfortunately, we did have a flat tire this morning in this vehicle, so I have a spare tire on there right now. You can see that we have that, that uh, flat showing right there. The LCD gives us a wide variety of different gauge readouts, transmission temperature, oil temperature, oil pressure, battery voltage, etc. We also get engine torque and engine horsepower. Then there are a lot of SRT specific gauges right here like the G-Force, front, rear, side, lap timers, all that kind of stuff, top speeds. We also get a trailer trip computer right here. So you can see that I have towed 402 miles with the trailer that I connected to the SRT earlier in the week. And that can again be adjusted and the trailers can be set up in the infotainment system. 
The trailer brake controller of course exists in software in this vehicle, but the physical controller is right there under the start stop button for the engine. We get the electronic trailer brake actuation and then the buttons that increase and decrease the trailer brake gain. Although it looks like you could add this to an existing Durango just by swapping out that trim piece again just there under the engine start stop button. There's a lot of software going on in the background so no this cannot be adapted to 2018 or earlier Durangos quite sadly. Moving out from there we find basically the same SRT steering wheel we find in some of the SRT passenger cars. Paddle shifters on the back, we have down on the left and up over there on the right, but these are not full paddles. They only go to about here on the back of the steering wheel, and that's because below them we find track up and down on the left and then volume up and down over there on the right. We have the controls for the regular cruise control system over here, the radar adaptive cruise control system below that, this four-way joystick button controls that multifunction LCD behind the steering wheel, and then we get dedicated phone hang-up pickup and voice command buttons on the left. Zero to 60 is, as you'd expect, very, very fast in the Durango SRT, and the exhaust noises are just incredible. I've always loved this 6.4 liter V8, regardless of what product it's been under. But in this one, we get 4.6 seconds to zero to 60. So definitely slower than some of the other SRT products out there that use the 6.4 liter V8, but that's mainly due to the overall curb weight. This Durango weighs just over 5,500 pounds. So just because this is technically a crossover, that doesn't mean this is going to be lighter weight than something like a Yukon XL or a Chevy Suburban. But on the other hand, because of the design of the Durango, from the chassis to the way the suspension has been tuned, etc., this definitely feels more car-like than any of those other body-on-frame alternatives, even something like a Chevy Tahoe RST. It's not going to feel as direct, as sporty as this model here. This particular model stopped from 60 miles an hour back to zero in 110 feet. That is an exceptionally good stopping distance for something that's this big and this heavy, and it definitely puts the overall performance figures of the Durango SRT into something like the compact luxury category. Now, obviously, this is not going to hold the road as well as something like a BMW 340i, but it is going to hold the road much better than any of its direct competition. But if you were hoping that the Explorer ST would be a head-to-head -head competitor for the Durango SRT, then you will be a little bit disappointed. Zero to 60 acceleration is definitely behind this particular model, and stopping distances were also behind in our initial tests. Dodge has really done an awful lot of work to try and reduce the rear end lift that we see in the 5.7 liter versions of the Durango, so we don't see that in the SRT. They've also given us much wider and much stickier tires on this model that really grip the road very well. This particular model has 295 with summer tires on it, and they definitely have an incredible amount of grip. The 6.4 liter V8 engine and the more aggressive final drive ratio we find in the Durango SRT has another benefit when it comes to towing, and that is engine braking. If you live in a mountainous area, you know that you really want to use as much engine braking as possible to really save the brakes, especially in your trailer, because trailers have drum brakes, they're not going to have the same kind of cooling ability that we find in disc brakes. So if you're towing 8,700 pounds and you're going down a steep downhill grade, you're going to want to use engine braking, so that way you can save those trailer brakes so you'll have them when you actually need them. And with a bigger V8 engine like this under the hood versus especially something like a twin turbo six cylinder engine in a Ford Expedition, this is going to offer you an awful lot more engine braking. So when it comes to overall handling, I'm definitely going to give this particular model an A. If you want a better handling three row crossover, you really will have to look into the luxury segment. Out on rougher roads like the gravel road that we're on here, it's obvious that the Durango SRT has a firmer suspension tune than the rest of the Durango lineup. But we also get an adaptive suspension, which is a really nice touch and something that's missing from the rest of the Durango lineup. These are not adaptive air shocks like we see in certain versions of the Jeep Grand Cherokee. These are pretty traditional adaptive dampers, so they don't change the vehicle's ride height. But they do change how soft or how firm the damping is. In our cabin noise test at 50 miles an hour, this was a hair louder than the 5.7 liter version of the Durango. This came in at 71 and a half decibels. That's mainly due to the exhaust note that we get in the back. Now, this particular model has the stock exhaust exhaust setup. There is also an available aftermarket accessory from Mopar that will make it even louder, but as it is, this is a pretty loud exhaust. And if I were to just drop this down here, say to second gear, you can tell there's definitely an awful lot of noise coming from the back. And that can get a little bit drowny if you're out on the highway towing, especially if you're doing a lot of hill climbing, because this may have to drop down to fifth gear. It's going to be hanging out right around maybe 2,000, 2,300 RPM, something like that to climb the hill. It's not really revving terribly high, but it's at this RPM range where you definitely get that droning sound in the cabin. 
If you're out on the highway, you could get about 20 to 25 miles per gallon if you're treating the Durango SRT very, very gently. In a recent run where we were trying to compare overall fuel economy when towing, we had this out on level highway for a decent stretch going just 55 miles an hour. We averaged 25 MPG on that run. We do have cylinder deactivation on this engine. There's an eco mode, which will make it a little bit more aggressive, but again, 55 miles an hour, pretty darn slow got 25 miles per gallon. Now, if I were to attach a 3,800 pound trailer to the back, that would drop way down to about 14, 15 MPG out on the highway. And then if I were to put stuff on the trailer, as we finally did in our towing test with those big water tanks, then the fuel economy dropped down to around nine MPG. So obviously a big vehicle like this with a big V8 engine and a lot of towing ability, you're going to have to pay for that at the pump. Bottom line out on the road, the SRT is an awful lot of fun. The overall handling is definitely improved over the rest of the Durango lineup. Now we do have to sacrifice a little bit of ride for that. Overall acceleration is excellent and the exhaust note is absolutely incredible. It has a great note. I found myself shifting up and down just so I could hear more of that exhaust note. The Durango is sort of an odd entry because the lower end versions very clearly compete with something like a base Ford Explorer or a base Nissan Pathfinder or a base Chevy Traverse, and they start at $30,445. That gets you the absolute base trim with the V6 engine and a five seat configuration. If you want the three row Durango, then it's gonna be just a hair more in that base model. Things get a little bit different when we start taking a look at the V8 versions of the Durango, like the Durango RT, the V8 optional in the Citadel, and of course the SRT model as well. If you want the 5.7 liter V8 engine, that'll start just over $44,000, and that's where we get the over 7,000 pounds of towing ability that is class leading when we're taking a look at three row crossovers in America. So that's significantly more than you could tow in the Pathfinder, in the Ford Explorer, in something like the Toyota Highlander or the Honda Pilot. In addition to having towing figures that are relatively similar to those full-size body-on-frame SUVs, we find about the same kind of interior room as many of those options as well because of the greater packaging efficiency that we see in the Durango's unibody design. But the big thing you'll notice is that the 5.7 liter V8 Durango is significantly less expensive than many of those other options. And what's really interesting about that is that when we take a look at the SRT's price tag, which is a pretty significant bump over the 5.7, it's about a $14,000 leap to get from the 5.7 RT into the SRT model, that's still well within the price tag of something like the Yukon, the Tahoe, the Sequoia, the Expedition, etc. So it doesn't seem quite so irrational of a jump as it might if you're shopping for something like a Nissan Pathfinder and then you've ended up wandering along to this particular video or to the Dodge dealer and you're starting to take a look at the various options in the Durango lineup. The big thing to remember is that most of the price difference between the RT and the SRT is wrapped up in the performance figures, not necessarily in extra feature content, although we do get a little bit more content in the SRT. I decided to take a look at some of the options that are available for the Durango because some of them really popped out at me when I was taking a look at the window sticker on the model we had. The first one is the racing stripe uh, that our model had. You'd probably seen that earlier in the video. That's a $1,200 option. It is fairly pricey. Uh, the spare tire is a $395 option. If you don't opt for that on the SRT, then you don't get a spare. It's a little bit different than the rest of the Durango lineup because we don't have the availability of a full-size spare in the SRT. It just wouldn't fit according to Dodge. So instead we get a compact spare tire if you choose that option box. That's definitely different than for instance on my Durango, which does have a full size spare tire. There's also a $1,600 red leather option. I have to say that I would probably check that option box because I do like the way that it looks. The red seat belts are fairly inexpensive. Our model had those, those were $95. We also had the high performance brake option on our model. That was a $1,295 option. I don't think I would spend it because we already get the upgraded Brembo brakes with the larger swept area, more aggressive stopping ability, and the high performance brakes does take you to the next level in performance, but it's also going to increase your maintenance costs. So unless you plan on really taking your Durango out on a track, I would probably just stick with the base SRT brake option. An interesting option available for 2020 is the lightweight option, which removes the third row, takes a few pounds out of the Durango, and gives you a five-seat vehicle. Now, why you would want a five-seat Durango SRT over a five-seat Grand Cherokee SRT, I'm not entirely clear because the two vehicles are, again, very, very similar. If you like the Durango styling more than the Grand Cherokee SRT styling and you need a little bit more cargo area, that might be an option because we do get about 10 cubic feet more storage space in the Durango 
than we do in the Grand Cherokee. But the extra dimensions of the Durango definitely make it handle a little bit different than the Grand Cherokee SRT. The last option is the trailer tow option, which is right around $1,200. That's definitely something that I would get. It gets the integrated trailer brake controller. It also bundles with it the temporary spare tire. And then of course we get the factory hitch with the four and seven pin wiring harnesses in the back. Comparisons are pretty tricky with the Durango because there's really nothing in America quite like it. And that's probably why Durango sales have been so stable over the last five or 10 years. You could compare it to something like a body on frame SUV. I'm just going to toss a picture of a GMC Yukon up here because the Yukon, the Tahoe, the Sequoia, the Armada, etc. They're all basically in the same boat when we're talking about comparisons. The Durango is going to be notably more nimble, whether we're talking about the 5.7 or especially the 6.4 liter SRT model. It's going to be more fun to drive. It's going to be faster zero to 60. And oddly enough, it's going to tow more than most of the options in this particular segment. And although the Durango SRT may sound pretty pricey, top out at around $77,000 starting over $60,000. When you compare it to the body on frame competition, it ends up being a pretty good deal, oddly enough. The Yukon, for instance, starts just under $50,000. And if you add all of the options to comparably equip it roughly to what we saw in the Durango, you'd end up at around $80,000. And you wouldn't have the leather stitch dashboard that we found in the model that we were testing and you wouldn't have tow ratings that were quite as high. It would tow up to 8,400 pounds. The Durango SRT gets just a little bit higher in its tow rating at 8,700 pounds. And the way that the Durango tows is going to be pretty good, even when compared against the Yukon. And then when you don't have a trailer connected, the SRT is obviously going to be an awful lot more fun. It definitely is a more driver oriented vehicle. Now on the downside, we're talking about a vehicle that seats six, not seats seven. It's one of the downsides to the SRT version. For some reason, the only way that we can get a second row that seats three in the SRT Durango is by removing the third row. So you go from six seats down to five seats in that model. But aside from that, there aren't too many other compromises because the cargo area in the back of the regular wheelbase Yukon is just about the same as it is in the Durango. Moving on to the new kit on the block, the Ford Explorer ST. I have to say that when the ST launched, I was expecting it to be more of a Durango SRT competitor. But when you look at the specs, the pricing and the performance, it's not really the same thing. In fact, in some ways, the Explorer ST is more of a direct competitor to the 5.7 liter V8 that we find in the Durango lineup. It produces about 400 horsepower from its twin turbo V6 engine and a decent amount of torque as well. But that's notably below what we see in the Durango SRT and Ford was not as aggressive with the overall gear ratios in the Explorer as Dodge was in the Durango. The result is that zero to 60 acceleration lands somewhere in the middle of the Durango lineup between the 5.7 liter V8 and the 6.4 liter V8 in the Durango lineup. And overall pricing definitely ends up below the Durango SRT. In fact, if you fully option your Explorer ST, you will just get up to about where the Durango SRT starts. Another big differentiator is the way that Dodge and Ford decided to design the vehicles when it came to towing. The Explorer doesn't have the option of a trailer brake controller, and it doesn't have the high tow ratings that we see in the Durango lineup. It appears that Ford just chose not to design the Explorer in that way, most likely because they have the Expedition in their lineup and Dodge didn't have another large SUV. So they just jammed all the towing ability into their midsize vehicle. With those two options out of the way, let's talk about alternatives that can give you the acceleration performance that we see in the Durango. The first one would be BMW's X5 with the twin turbo V8 engine that will go zero to 60 in 4.6 seconds definitely in the neighborhood of the Durango SRT. Obviously, the big difference here is that we're talking about a luxury vehicle versus a mainstream vehicle. So the BMW is going to have a better put together interior, better exterior fit and finish, etc. It's not going to have the raucous V8 noise that we find in the Durango, but it is going to give us absolutely excellent acceleration. Now, overall tow ratings are going to be a little bit lower, even though the X5 does deliver pretty healthy tow ability. That brings us along to what you could consider a distant cousin to the Dodge Durango, interestingly enough, the Mercedes-Benz GLE 63. The GLE traces its lineage back to the Mercedes-Benz ML, and that was back when Chrysler was owned by Mercedes, and the Dodge Durango and the Grand Cherokee were co-developed with that generation Mercedes ML. And that's why the Durango uses some parts that are definitely very familiar if you're a Mercedes owner. 
Before we go, let's toss in kind of an odd comparison here, and that would be the Ram 1500 pickup truck. Obviously, the pickup truck is going to give you better payload and better towing ability when properly equipped. But interestingly enough, there may be models of the Ram 1500 that could tow about what we can in the Durango SRT. And the Durango SRT is still going to tow very, very well. It's going to be an awful lot peppier when you have those heavier weights attached to it because of the way that everything is geared. So it's going to feel a little bit more sprightly off the line than something like certain versions of the Ram 1500. Now it's not going to have the cargo bed in the back, but instead we get three rows of seats on the inside. So although theoretically you could seat six in your Ram 1500, six people are going to be an awful lot more comfortable in the Durango. So if my money were on the line, I would just get the 5.7 liter V8. It gets the two-speed transfer case. It's going to be a little bit more off-road capable. It's a little bit higher off the ground. And I think it's just a perfect fit in this particular segment. It has a stout towing ability of around 7,500 pounds when properly equipped. You can now get the integrated trailer brake controller in that model. You can get skid plates as well, which are not available in the SRT model. And it's frankly just a better value overall than the SRT. But the SRT is an awful lot of fun. And I would also say it's a pretty good deal if you're looking at shopping it against those full-size SUV options. So I would take the Durango SRT as a similarly priced alternative to some of those top-end competitors, like the Expedition, like the Yukon. That's definitely what I would get every day of the week. But I would also say if you're shopping in that manner, I would probably save the extra cash, get the 5.7 liter Hemi as well. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. What would you get if you were spending your cash on an SRT in this segment? Would you get this? Would you get the 5.7? Or would you get a Grand Cherokee SRT, especially if you're contemplating that rear seat delete option in the Durango? Let me know down there in the comment section below and be sure and find us over at facebook.com slash I'll see you later.